Today, as the title of the video might suggest, I'm going to talk to you about Schlieren photography. This is a simple technique used to visualise heat waves and sound waves. Now think of all the amazing uses of being able to see shock waves and explosions. Before we start, I'll just describe the setup of Schlieren photography, and you'll be pleased to know that most of the kit you need is fairly simple to get hold of. Firstly, you'll need a spherical mirror. It has to be spherical, so check what it says on the box. This might be harder to get than the other stuff, as this type of mirror isn't particularly common. It's called a spherical mirror because the line of the mirror could be continued to create a full circle. Anyway, you'll also need an aperture or some sort of small hole which you can pass light through. You then need a pretty strong torch, the stronger the better, but no need to go over the top. Finally, you need a razor or some sharp thin material, a knife edge will do the trick too. And that's it. I'd also recommend using a camera to see the Schleer effect better, but it's not necessary. Now to actually set it all up. Suspend your aperture in the air like you just don't care. I use some clamps for this, but I'm sure you can make something up if you don't have the kit. A pile of books would work fine. Next put the light source behind the slit, and place your mirror a moderate distance away from the light source, but leaving room for changes. We'll need to adjust this setup later. Turn on the torch and see where the reflected light from the mirror lands. This may take a while, and you might need a piece of card to see where the light spot is more easily. Once you've found the spot, turn the mirror so the spot is next to the slit. The closer the better, but you'll need to put your eye near the spot, or better still, a camera. Then place a razor on the spot, so it roughly covers half the light spot. Now comes the tricky part. Move the mirror forwards and backwards until the light spot is focused as much as possible. You can tell it's focusing if it gets smaller, and unfocusing if it gets larger. The focused light spot should be the same size as the slit hole, but you might not be able to get it exactly on point. Now try to adjust the razor to make it block half the light. Then all you need to do is place your camera or your eye behind the razor on the light spot. This may require a bit of moving around, but eventually you'll be able to see faint ripples on a greyish background. You've now successfully visualised heat waves. Unfortunately, in order to see sound waves, you'll need a slow motion camera, as sound waves travel at 768 miles per hour, which is obviously too fast for us to see with a normal camera, let alone our eye. Before I go into all the complicated science behind Schlieren photography, we need to know a few fundamental principles behind it all, most notably refraction. This is when a light ray enters a material and bends slightly. More accurately, when it enters a denser medium, which is a physics-y way of saying material, the light ray bends towards what is called the normal line, which is another physics-y word for an imaginary line that's at 90 degrees to the surface of the object. When a light ray enters a less dense medium, it bends away from the normal. An example of this bending of light is when you look into a swimming pool. It may look shallow, but it actually isn't. This is because our brain doesn't understand refraction. So as we stare into the water and light rays from the object shine into our eyes, they bend outwards as they leave the water. But our brains, being their unassuming selves, think the light rays have travelled in a straight line. This means that our brain thinks the light rays come from a different height to where they actually do. Our brains think the object is where these two lines meet not where the refracted lines meet. But that's not the end of it. The refractive index of a material, in other words, how much the material bends light, is affected by density, which is defined as the mass of a block of that material with dimensions 1 metre by 1 metre by 1 metre. This may not be obvious, but just imagine all the different lenses you get in a glasses shop. Glasses work on the principle of refraction to bend the light into your eye more accurately. There are many lenses made up of different materials. One made of a dense material, that is one with more mass in a one metre cube block of the material, would bend light a lot, meaning it would have a high refractive index. 
whereas a lens made up of a less dense material would bend light a lot less, so it would have a lower refractive index. You're probably starting to wonder why this helps the process of visualising heat waves. Well, what if I told you hot air was less dense than cool air? That's right, the air molecules in hot air move around much more than those of cold air, which means hot air expands as the air molecules moving collide, pushing each other apart. This makes the hot air less dense because there are less air molecules per metre cube than in cool air. If you're struggling to picture this, just imagine the Millennium Falcon travelling through an asteroid field. If there are fewer asteroids in a certain region of space, like there are fewer molecules in a certain volume of air, Han Solo is more likely to escape the dreaded empire. So this means hot air, which I said was less dense, has a lower refractive index than cold air. This is important for later. Now on to sound waves. We normally visualise sound waves like this, but sound waves are actually made up of high density and low density parts, sort of like squashes and stretches in air. These high density parts have a high refractive index, and the low density ones have a low refractive index, like different temperatures of air having different refractive indices. This is really useful for the Schlieren effect, as you'll see later. Anyway, because physicists are lazy, we normally just visualise sound waves as curved lines, which usually symbolise the high pressure areas of the wave. But how does this work? Firstly, we need to imagine the light coming into the mirror. It's reflected back to the same point. For the purpose of making this video less cluttered, or think of the mirror as more of a lens, which bends light instead of reflecting it. Don't worry, you don't need to understand why we can see it as that, but hopefully you can see that the light rays passing into the mirror can also be depicted as light rays coming into a lens, and the light rays being reflected by the mirror can also be depicted as the light rays coming out of the lens. Imagine many different light rays being emitted by the light source and passing through the aperture which is used to make sure the light rays all come from a single point. Otherwise, there'd be multiple light rays travelling through one point, which makes the image very blurry. So back to using our point source, if you have some glass in the way, the light rays passing through the glass will actually bend and travel to the mirror at a different angle. Now remember our diagram is actually a mirror, so the area on the left is the same as the area on the right, which is why I have a glass object on either side of the lens diagram. Anyway, when the mirror reflects the refracted light ray, it doesn't travel back to its original starting point. Instead, it travels somewhere completely different. In the same way, the Schlieren effect uses the fact that hot air has a lower refractive index than normal air to visualise hot and cold air. Now imagine we replace that piece of glass with a blob of hot air. The light ray still bends, just not that much. This is why the razor is placed at the end of the reflected light. Any slight refractions will be cut off by the razor edge. That's also why the razor edge cut out roughly half the light point. Even though some of the blocked light will have come directly from the light source, there will still be some light that's been refracted and it is the fact that this light is blocked which creates the Schlieren effect. The refracted light that passed through the heat patch doesn't appear in the image. Instead, it appears as a lack of light, in other words, a dark patch. If the razor cut off more of the light source, the Schlieren effect would be more pronounced, but the overall image would be darker because less light would reach the eye. If the razor cut off less of the light spot, the Schlieren effect would be less pronounced, and the image will be brighter overall. So 50% seems like a good compromise. Now as you may have noticed if you're following along with me, some of the heat spots appear paler than their surroundings. The difference in the shade of the heat spots is caused, among other things, by the geometry of the heat spots. However, I won't talk much about this, as it's pretty unpredictable. 
Another thing you may have noticed if you're doing this at home is that as you hold an object in the Schlieren setup closer to your eye or the camera, a doubling effect occurs. This is caused by the light source and razor being off axis with each other, i.e. not being in the same position, which means two light rays pass through the same point in space. This is quite difficult to explain in words, so hopefully this diagram helps. As you can see, one light ray is blocked by the object on the way into the mirror, and a completely different light ray is blocked in the opposite direction. This means these two light rays don't reach the camera, so instead of one black spot appearing, two do. Obviously it's impossible to put a camera and a torch in the same place, but by making sure the torch and the rays are as near as possible to each other, we can make sure that the doubling effect is diminished. However, there is one solution to this problem, but unless you're a complete physics nerd, you won't be able to do it. This involves using something called a beam splitter, which is a device that reflects half the light shine onto it, but lets the other half through. If we placed a beam splitter in front of the mirror and placed the light source so that it was shining into the beam splitter, we would see that whilst 50% of the light would be reflected by the beam splitter, the other 50% would go straight through it. Then from the reflection of the mirror, another 50% would be reflected as the light hit the beam splitter, and another 50% would go through the beam splitter and reach the camera. This would fix any problems due to the off axisness of the torch and camera, but the light that would reach the camera would only be 25% of the original light source's intensity. So although there would be no image doubling, the picture would be much dimmer overall. Again, a compromise would have to be reached. Phew, we've finally passed all the sciencey stuff, but after all that you might be wondering what the technique is actually useful for. It's commonly used to visualise the aerodynamics of aircraft, as well as to analyse the shockwaves caused by ballistics. Schlieren photography is a very useful tool, and hopefully you now know a little more about it.